on our bulletin today, if you see again on the front of our bulletin, was taken by our secretary. Uh, it looks so professional. She and her husband walked to what she was told was a waterfall. When she got there, she found out that it was a three-foot waterfall. We call that a washout when I grew up, right? But uh, I asked her to, I gave her this quote a few weeks ago, and the Lord really, I think it's a timely thing that God did. The quote on there is from one of the preachers that I have grown to love. Uh, he's on the radio all the time. Uh, you probably heard him with that great big English accent that he has. His name's Alistair Begg. But I love this quote. It says, Our God, we pray that you would give to us a genuine desire to know you, to love you, to be filled with all the fullness of your spirit, and to manifest in our lives the evidences of your abiding presence. We've been in this series now since the beginning of June on what it means to hear from God, to listen to God, the whisper of God, to join with Him in that relationship, to hear what the Word says, to get the distractions out of the way, and to make sure that as we are seeking to walk in Him, that we would never, ever, 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 ever grieve, as we are warned in Ephesians 4.30 not to do, to never grieve the Holy Spirit that is the very voice of God for us. So I wanted to bring this to you today in John 15 about abiding. I really did not want to end this series until I heard those words that I think we need to hear so very well about abiding in the presence of God. Now, this was written, obviously, well, John was written by John, one of Jesus' disciples, one that he called, he was a former fisherman, uh, probably somewhere around the age of Jesus, maybe uh, a few years younger. So when, G when he heard Jesus, Jesus was 30 when he began his ministry. He may have been 27, 28, 29, 30 years of age. We're not exactly sure. But he and his older brother were fishermen, and they were, they were, they were probably in calloused hands. Fishermen, they probably had harsh language. I mean, they were just people of the world, blue-collar people. But, but Jesus saw something special in them. Matter of fact, they were called the sons of thunder. I mean, the loud, roaring thunder. You're probably thinking, these guys were not the, the smoothest guys rough around the edges, but yet Jesus learned to call him the Beloved. That's a great nickname. And he walked with Christ and he saw all the miracles and saw the, the face of the Lord when he would look at people and love people. He was there at Calvary. He was also there when, in the upper room when Jesus showed up and said, here I am, and he saw the resurrected Christ. For 60 years, he had walked with the risen Lord. All the other three Gospels had been written. His was the last Gospel to be written, probably 30 years later than the other three. And you know what? He was probably now in his upper 80s or maybe his lower 90s. And, and we're told, I'm not there yet, but we're told that older people like to reminisce a little bit. And I wonder how many times he was thinking back to those precious times with Christ and remembering the words of Christ. And John's gospel is really different from the others. The, the passages are longer, and where the other gospels would give you all the details and tell the stories, John really focuses on the meaning of what those stories in the life of Christ meant. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in John 20, verse 30, he said, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He is thinking back and saying, I'm writing these things 
there's so many things that I could have written, but, but I'm writing these things so that you'll know that he is the Messiah. He is the way, the truth, and the life that he would pen in chapter 14. And that if you ever come to know Christ, you'll find life, eternal life, in him. And in John, when you get to chapter 11, he tells an event that happens one week before Jesus' last week in Jerusalem, when Lazarus was resurrected. And then in chapter 12, he talks about the, the triumphal entry, and, and literally only in one chapter does he tell the events of that last week. But when you get to chapter 13, and 14, and 15, and 16, and 17, in those five chapters, he really talks extensively about what happened in the last hours of Jesus' life. Truly, they really meant so very much to him. I wonder how many times he reflected back on it. Do y'all like secrets? I mean, somebody tells you a secret. and You just, I mean, it gets your attention and you want to hear, ex- oh yes, please tell me a secret. Stand with us in honor of reading God's words. and Let me share with you one of the last words that he told those disciples that they did not know before. A word that we need to hear today. And I pray that we hear it not only with our ears. I pray we hear it with our hearts. John 15. Thank you for standing in honor of reading God's Word. Verse 1. I am the true vine. Notice the word true vine. Not just another vine. The vine. My father is the vine dresser. The husbandman. Some translations say the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's a statement of fact. Every branch that bears fruit in me, He prunes, that's a promise, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Here's the secret. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Did you hear that? That's a promise. It's a statement of fact. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Come on now, that's a promise of God. I didn't speak that. You didn't speak that. Jesus spoke that. Let me say it to you again. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Can I say it this way? Absolutely nothing. Nada. I don't care how wise you are. I don't care how beautiful you are. I don't care how much of this world you know. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care the riches of this world. I don't care anything that you bring to the table. I don't care anything of what your resume says. Jesus said, without him, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch. That's a promise. And is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. We better hear those words. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. That's a relationship of love right there, folks. And it shall be done for you. That's a promise. By this, this abiding relationship, my Father is glorified. The gardener, the author, the plan who put all of this in place 
He receives glory and honor and praise in this relationship that he's placed us in. That you bear much fruit. This is our purpose. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy, Jesus' joy, may remain. Did you like that word remain? Nothing can take it away. The joy that is in Christ will remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, our God, our Savior, our Lord, thank you for the promises that you spoke to your disciples that last night that are translated and promised to us as well. By that very same Holy Spirit, whisper to our hearts your love, your praise, and your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Jesus is the true vine. It would be very easy for those people in that day. They had heard him preach many parables. He had given many analogies. <coughs> but they would look on just about any hillside around. That it was extremely familiar for them to walk by and to see the grapevines that were there. It was a norm of the day. And the people... In those, the husbandmen, this was their livelihood. This was their value. This is how they would take care of themselves. You better take care of that vine. And the expert at doing that, the gardener, the vine dresser, knew the value to take care of the vine and that which grew from the vine. And Jesus says to them, I am, this is the last of the seven I am statements that Jesus made about himself. In describing who he is, the Christ, the Messiah, the light of the world, he said, I am the true vine. My Father is watching out for us, taking care of us. The husband. You, he says in verse 6, you are the branches that are grafted in to the vine. You see, you can take a branch and the true vine literally graft it in. And as it is grafted in, the very sap, the life of the, of the vine will begin to flow fresh and new into that branch where it can live in relationship, it can live in life, and it can bear fruit that comes from the vine. Now, in the Old Testament, we understand that Israel, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say Israel, the ones that were to be God's chosen people? God chose them, and God grafted them in to the life of Christ. Abraham. God made a promise to him. Your children, like the stars in heaven, like the sands underneath your feet. I will bless you. I will multiply you. And yes, his great-grandchild was taken down into Egypt. And yes, the family gathered down to him there. And they spent 430 years in slavery in Egypt. But God brought them back because he promised that he would take them to the promised land. He said, I will be your God. I will provide for you. I will take care of you. Listen, anything you need, I will provide. He was the vine to them. They were grafted into them. But when you get to Isaiah chapter 5, when it is the beautiful description of everything that God did for Israel, grafted into the vine, it said that the fruit that they produced was bu'ushin, the Hebrew word that means wild, sour berries. 
the ones that God loved, chose, redeemed, made his own, and yet the fruit that came from them. Bu'ushin, worthless. I mean, the, the phrase there means one that will set your teeth on edge. Y'all ever been eating the good stuff and all of a sudden you put one in your mouth and you want to go, Pff. people watching online did, did he really just do that? Yeah. Pff. How sad it would be for God to look at his vine, his precious, holy vine, and to look the, for the fruit that is to come from it, but to find not the healthy fruit that honors the vine, but to find that which has been spoiled, ruined. I'm going to use this word, wretched. Bu'ushin. So God made another chance. I'm a Gentile. I'm not a Jew of the tribe. But Jesus made a way for me too. And God allowed me to be grafted into the vine. To where the life of Christ could now live in me. And those disciples, as they heard these words, and they knew the story so well, as it was pictured among all the people around them, they said, hmm, this is what God wants to do. Now listen. Hear this verse 6, or verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. We are nothing other than fruit hangers. You don't go around bragging on the fruit hangers. I mean, our job is to be attached to the vine and allow the vine, come on now, not what I do, but allow the vine to do something in me. I can't produce, I mean, I can be one of those that says, but I can't do it. But listen, if I can just stay with him, Listen to Him. Obey Him. Trust Him. Walk with Him. Surrender to Him. That He can do something in me, with me, come on now, through me, and produce sweet fruit for Him. This is who I am. This is what I'm supposed to be. I can't make the fruit, but I can be one that, praise God, he can hang some fruit on. You know, we look at the, 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 the branch, and the branch is so beautiful with leaves, but we're meant to be more than just bearers of leaves. So if he sees a beautiful lance that has all this stuff on it, he said, hold on, no. the life-giving Spirit, the, the sap that flows through it, is supposed to produce fruit. So it, it, I need to cut it back. So if you're bearing small grapes, he wants something greater, and, and he'll start pruning you back. I have a series of sermons. I was going through a time in my life of, of God pruning, and, and, and I, I, I stated the fact. I said, God's pruned me till I think he's got me down to the stump. Y'all ever felt that way? Lord, what else can you cut off? Anything that doesn't look like him. I don't like to prune. I really don't. I, I, I've got fruit trees in my yards that I've planted, and, and, and I, I, they look so beautiful out there. But you know what? I look at them, and I'm like, you know, I, they're beautiful, but I really want more than leaves. Can I get an amen? I mean, apple trees are supposed to produce what? 
apples. I got the most beautiful peaches, peach trees. That I didn't get one peach this year. I mean, they're gorgeous. And I go out there and I, I look at the leaves on them and I'm thinking, you know, it sure would be great if I had a peach right now. Jimmy Eccles owns J. Moore Farms. Become a friend. And uh, I asked him. He was showing me through the farm and showed me all this stuff that he had. I, 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 he has a little golf cart. and he, We were driving through, and I said, Brother Jimmy, tell me how to prune. So he took me up to the peach tree, and he, he, he made a statement of something that just I didn't know. He's been doing it a whole lot longer. You know, he, he, this man knows what he's doing. He said, Brother Brian, that's what he calls me. He says, fruit only comes on first-year wood. I didn't know that. And I hadn't been pruning because it looked so good. And then when I did get fruit, it was that little small, puny stuff. He said, fruit only comes on first year wood. So you have to prune all the other stuff out of it that doesn't need to be there so he can branch out and bring something new to your life and that's where he's going to produce the fruit. So all the, the sap that is flowing through it it can be useful in your life. In our front yard, we've uh, it's about a 150 yards somewhere around there from our house down the driveway to the road. And, and I've got down there close to the road, I've, I've got this great big oak tree. By the way, I don't think it's an oak tree. I just pick up the sticks. That fall. But um, when... Wintertime, it just looks so bare, you know, just, just the branches out there. And up at the top of the hill, I've got two uh, outdoor, they, they rock, little chairs that rock, metal. And I, I'm a rocker. Y'all haven't figured that out. I'm a rocker. Uh, I just can't sit still. And I got two of them there, and I, I'll go out early in the morning, and a lot of mornings, Lynn will grab her Bible and She'll walk out there with me, and we'll, we'll sit there, and we'll read our Bibles, and I'll drink coffee, and she drinks Diet Coke, and um, um, we enjoy the morning. And I noticed this spring something since I learned last year. I got looking at that huge oak tree down there, and it started to green up at the bottom. And I thought to myself, doggone it, I got some vine on that thing that's growing. It's going to take over my oak tree. But then I realized, no, it starts at the bottom. And as the sap starts to flow up, it starts to green out from the trunk out the branches. And then it would grow further out the branches and higher up the tree. And the next week it would go a little further out and a little higher up. And then it would go a little further out and a little higher up. Now, this morning, I got out and I was looking at it. Uh, I have a big bay window in my house, and I, I, I was looking at it. It was about 6 o'clock this morning. The light was coming up, and I had my coffee. And it is the most beautiful tree in season. It's exactly the way God meant it to be. And I got thinking about all that life-giving that starts and grows out. And I don't know where we are at New Holland. I don't know where you are in your life. <clears throat> I don't know how beautiful, I don't know how much God has pruned. I don't know any of those things, but I'm here to tell you that our responsibility is to make sure that we abide with Him. Because if you ever find a branch when the sap quits flowing, it will wither, it will die, and sooner or later, we're either going to cut it off or I'll pick it off the ground where it's already rotted and died. May it never be my life such an example. 
tree or the vine and the branch and the fruit. I think about what Paul says, we in our Christian life, it is a walk. And I think of the strength that he gives us and the direction he gives us and the destination that he's taken us to. Or I think about the eagle, how majestic and how it flies. And he doesn't do all this. What the eagle will do is find its place and feel the wind blowing. And then it will set itself against the wind. And it will go from this height to this height, simply not by doing this, but by simply letting the wind carry it to the heights that it could never reach otherwise. Letting the wind, as we are as Christians, to let the wind of the Holy Spirit blow us to that place. I think of Moses in the burning bush. Just any old bush, but yet when the power of God found that bush, the light of the glory of God was there. And the Word could speak, and it could be useful and beneficial. A zebra, when it has a baby, the mom will take the zebra baby away from the rest of the herd. And for weeks, a couple months, it will not let anybody else around. It will just be the mom and the child. <clears throat> Why? Because the mom knows that that child, the most important thing for that child is that it knows who mom is. And the mom will take care of it. The mom will provide it. And if, it, she, if she didn't take it away from the rest of the herd, then it would get confused and it would lose what it was. Christian, the Lord saves us for himself. And the most important thing that we can find out is who our dad is, who our Savior is, and where the life-giving nourishment comes from. And stay there. And yes, we can join the herd. We can be in the world, but we cannot be of the world. And we can be out there around all of these other circumstances and tragedies and, and difficulties and hardships, but yet we know where home base is. And we know how God can take care of us. How He can provide for us. Jesus that last night would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he would pray to the Father. Matter of fact, he would ask, Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, not what I will, not what's best for me, but your will be done. Really, he'd been pruned to the place where God could produce something through him. And that's what happened on Calvary. But in that garden, it was a garden of olive trees. If you take an olive plant, a real small plant, and you plant it out there in your garden, it will take 15 years for that olive tree to grow up to where it can produce fruit. Sounds like a long time, doesn't it? Fifteen years before it will begin to produce olives. But listen to this. I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit you'll never forget it. It will produce olives for 2,000 years. Yes, you heard me right. One tree 2,000 years. That means when Jesus knelt down in that garden, there were olive trees there that predated Abraham. And maybe there was a sprout that would grow that would still be alive today. And it never changes. The vine creates the branch. But what throws, flows through the vine and into the branch produces the fruit. 
It is not about us. We're just fruit hangers. Christ in us. Anything in my life that does not look like Jesus, the Holy Spirit needs to get rid of. Through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we need to have repentance in our heart and our life. We need to come to the place where we say, Lord, I trust in you. I believe in you. My life is in you. Lord, anything in my life that does not bring honor and glory into you, I, I surrender it to you. All my life to you. By the way, that sounds like salvation. And if you ever find that place, you'll find salvation. You repent of your sins. You come to Jesus Christ because he's the only one who can do it. He did it on the cross of Calvary. He gave his life a ransom. He shed his blood to cleanse you. He was resurrected three days after they put him into that tomb to give forth eternal life. And you can know eternal life. You can abide with him, not just now, but forever. And he can use you. Yes, even you. Like he did with that old dried up bush in the desert when he spoke to Moses, he can even use you. As a matter of fact, it brings him glory to produce fruit in our lives. Abiding with him is the most important thing we could do. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. And the joy that we share, verse 11 says, as we tarry there, none other has ever known. There is nothing in this world that compares with Christ in you, the hope of glory. The life of the Spirit putting His arms of love around you, whispering in your ear, you're my child. I love you. With an everlasting love. You don't disappoint me. You make me proud. And an eternal work begins right there.